Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Detroit Regional Chamber, Sandy Barua. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, welcome. Welcome to Ford Field. Uh, what an awesome venue for uh, an event, and we're so glad you could join us today. This is the fifth annual Detroit Regional Chamber State of the Region event and data download, and we're so excited you could be with us today. Because today is one of the days that we talk about our region as a whole. We know that our region has fabulous parts, fabulous cities, fabulous amenities, fabulous counties, but this is the day that we talk about it all as one. Now, this event and all the other events done by the Detroit Regional Chamber would not be possible without our fantastic sponsors. And our lead sponsor, not just this year, but for several years for this event, is Citizens Bank. And I want to thank Rick Hampson and the Citizens Bank team for their commitment to this. So uh, thank you so much, Citizens Bank. Our other sponsors for this event and that have made this possible is the Michigan Talent and Investment Agency, our great friends at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, our partners at Comcast Business, our friends at Kelly Services, and our great partners at Walsh College. Please thank all of our sponsors for their commitment to this event. Now, of course, most important to me is the board of directors for the Detroit Regional Chamber that are att in attendance today. They're my bosses, so this is a big part of my job evaluation. So thank you so much, board of directors, for being here. And I know we have uh, representatives from uh, Wayne County. We have a deputy uh, Wayne County executive here. We have two uh, Oakland County uh, deputy executives here. I know we have representatives from the city of Detroit and other uh, government officials. So thank you all for your public service and thank you for being here today. So, sure, give, give the government officials a bit of applause. We're so glad you're here, but this event isn't just for those of you who are here in the room. We want to ensure that the conversation that takes place today on this stage is shared beyond these walls. So the first thing is, you know, for the price of your lunch, you also get a homework assignment. And your homework assignment is to use your social media platforms. Some of you are Twitterers, some of you are YouTubers, some of you are Instagrammers or Facebookers. Whichever social media device you happen to bring today, use it. What did you hear today that was interesting? What was a new fact that you learned? What is it that you thought that, eh, I don't quite agree with that? Share that uh, on, on your social media platforms. Use the hashtag DETSOR, short for Detroit State of the Region, and share this with your networks. Also, I want everyone to know that this event is being live streamed, so people who weren't able to make it today have access to the content here. And of course, we're gonna videotape this and it'll be available on the Chamber website afterwards. So we're talking about regions. So why are regions important? Think of this, there are over 30 cities across the planet that have a population of 10 million people or more. I'm not talking about regions, I'm talking about actual cities. Just within their city confines, they have 10 million people. There are 500 plus cities across the planet that have a million people or more. So we have a great core city here in Detroit, and it get, gets better every day, but we don't even crack the top 500 in terms of size. So why does that matter? When we are out competing for international business and selling the great products and services that we have here in Michigan, it's really helpful if we can put a team out on the field that is more than just one city or one county. If we can talk about our entire region, then we are bringing a much more valuable set of assets to the competitive field that is out there in the international marketplace. So that's why regions are important. At the end of the day, businesses care about regions. Even today, 
if a business might locate in Oakland County, but their employees might live, say, in Washtenaw County, they're going to use the airport in Wayne County, and they're going to recreate in the water in Macomb County. So it's the entire package that really drives business to a region. So we're really fortunate. And our region is really substantial. 11 counties, over 7,000 square miles, 5.4 million people, and what's great for the Detroit Regional Chamber, 300,000 plus businesses that we're able to represent in some form or fashion. And it's a great field. Uh, it's a great team to be able to put on the field. And within those 300,000 businesses, we have 13 Fortune 500 companies in this region. And I tell you, my chamber and economic development colleagues across the country are really envious of our level of big corporate leaders that we have in this region. And that doesn't even count all of the other Fortune 500 companies that are represented here through you know, bank presidents and you know, local presidents. So we have a tremendous set of assets here in this region. One of the things that the Detroit Regional Chamber has been really, really fortunate uh, with is our ongoing and long-term partnership with Harvard Business School. We've been able to work with Harvard uh, on many different issues. Uh, certainly the U.S. Competitiveness Project, which I've been involved in uh, since its inception through our, our relationship with Michael Porter uh, over the years. Michael Porter, as you know, was one of our keynote speakers at the Mackinac Policy Conference not too long ago. We use Harvard's uh, cluster analysis in our economic development work, and they've been great partners with that. Every year, uh, myself and our friends at the Detroit Economic Club, we send 10 leading young professionals from the Detroit region to Harvard every year for the Young American Leaders Program. And we have been able to do that now for five years in a row. And Detroit's one of the cities that keeps getting asked back to participate in that. And we're going to continue our conversation and our relationship with Harvard today because we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, a guest speaker today from Harvard Business School, Professor Willie Shi. Professor Shi will be on the stage in just a few moments, and he's going to be joined by the one and only Devin Skillian from WDIV Channel 4 for a Q&A and a keynote address. One of the things that Professor Shi is going to be talking about is called the commons, C-O-M-M-O-N-S, the commons. Now, the commons back in the day, you know, you, you know, hundreds of years ago, referred to the land where animals used to graze that no one owned, but all the farmers could use jointly to allow their animals to graze. And the, you know, the thought there is that everyone benefited from this common area where the animals could graze, uh, but it wasn't necessarily owned, it wasn't privately held, it was just a common area. Today, the commons is equally important. When you think about a region and what the commons is, it's the ability to innovate. It's the ability to be competitive in a global marketplace, such as you know, R&D capability, process development, engineering skills, or other similar competencies. Every company benefits from an educated populace. Every community benefits from an educated populace. And every company, and every community and every person needs infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, internet connection. All of that is part of the commons. And in short, that you know, it is the commons that helps lift so many of the people and our companies that we all share. And that is one of the themes that you're going to hear in Professor Shi's remarks. So I would like to bring to the stage our keynote speaker, Willie Shi. Professor Shi is the Robert and James Sisnick Professor of Management of Practice at Harvard Business School. He is a noted American economist, and we're very pleased to have Professor Willie Shi here in Detroit today. Professor Shi. Thank, thank you, Sandy, for that introduction. You know, uh, I'm really delighted to join you here today. Uh, I, I actually am not really an economist by training. My father was an economist, and you know, I used to see him come home from work every night. It's like, oh man, I never want to do that. Okay, and then, 
I went into industry, and what do you think I have to work on every day? It's the economics, right? So uh, what I'm going to share with you today, most of my work has historically been on uh, American competitiveness, industrial competitiveness. I'm sort of the manufacturing guy at Harvard Business School, but I'm going to talk to you about retraining, okay? And I think it's particularly apropos with some of the news about Hamtramck and Lordstown and you know, uh, other headlines li lately about retraining. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the workforce retraining challenge and a project that I did with some students. And then I think with Devin, we'll have some other thoughts on recent announcements in the area. OK, now, the th one of the things I've been thinking about is this, uh, you know, we hear about automation. We hear about all these changes, right? There was the President's Council of Economic Advisors uh, issued a report last summer about addressing the reskilling challenge, right? And they said even if job creation outpaces job destruction in the years ahead, the skills that we are going to require in our workforce, which is really part of the commons, which makes an area attractive, are going to change, right? And the supply of skills hasn't really caught up. If you look at some of the stats on this, displaced workers are changing industry a lot more than historically that we've thought about because we're, we have such a high pace of change now. Okay, and uh, so how we retrain workers for these new skills, these new jobs, new capabilities is going to be very important. National Academy has just reported that uh, if workers take on a larger variety of jobs over their careers or the skill requirements shift, they'll need to learn more diverse skills, obvious to us. Okay, but one of the other things that's been going on at the same time is kind of the investment historically which was made by employers. I spent 28 years in industry, and I remember when I joined the workforce, my employer took much more responsibility for retraining and uh, keeping skills current. I know there are some projects. I know AT&T is doing a big project in retraining and reskilling. But you know, you see this kind of decline in training investments, uh, which is spread across uh, time and across a lot of industries. Right. So it's something that has been very concerning to me. Not great, but understandable. You know, one of the things I talk to others at the school, my colleagues about is, you know, is this a public good or is it a private good, right? Usually it's the workers who benefit the most, okay? But there's a portion of that benefit which spills over into the commons and will benefit the local economy, other firms in the area, right? So it's understandable. But then if you look at kind of our public expenditures, and this also comes from, uh, the uh, National Economic Council report on s public expenditures on active labor market programs. Right there we are in the U.S. bringing up the bottom. Well, not quite the bottom, okay, but our public sector spending on training and other programs to help workers is now really very, very low compared to anywhere else. And in, on top of that, if you think about it, a lot of what we talk about on training uh, really reflects people who are just coming out of school, preparation for the workforce. I talk about that as being education is really front-loaded, front-loaded in your career. You see that red zone, which is a spike when people spend for college education. Okay, but what, what happens when people are uh, further along in their career, especially as we see industries going through transitions? Okay, you know, so it goes to this whole question, is the public good or is the private good? Now I'm going to tell you a story, and most of the rest of the talk is going to be focused on this story. A little over a year ago, two of my first year students who were in the second year came to me and they brought me a copy of this book, Janesville. I don't know how many of you have seen it. I think here in Detroit you've gone through a very similar type of story. What happens when the, uh, uh, the principal employer in the town, the anchor of the economy, closes down and kind of the economic destruction that that uh, uh, brings to the whole area. And it was interesting because these two students, they knew I had focused a lot on uh, industrial competitiveness. I was thinking a lot about automation at the time. So I told them a story. I, I, I told them that uh, I was down in Washington uh, at the National Economic Council and uh, I told, uh, this was in the previous administration, one of the president's advisors at the time, I said, you know, when the, glo when the Great Recession hit, I was one of the lucky ones. I had come to the Harvard Business School the year before. But a lot of people in my cohort 
lost their positions, they lost their jobs, they never were able to get something comparable to that. Does that sound familiar? Okay. And I said, you know, these people have 10 to 15 productive years to give. What are we going to do for them? And the answer was, we think we give up on them, okay, which wasn't very satisfying to me. Okay, so these students and I are talking about this, and to their credit, they say, okay, Professor Shi, what are we going to do about it? And uh, I have to give them credit for that, right? That's exactly how I want them to think. Okay, so I said, well, what we have to do is we have to go conduct a research project, and we really need to get under this, and then we need to write about it and try to influence people, how people think about this question. So, you know, the popular narrative on older workers is they're too old, they're too set in their ways, they've been out of school too long, you know, the old, I can't teach an do old dog new tricks, we have to give up on them, okay? And so we embarked on this furious research project where we were interviewing people all over the country and I took them on a, re on a road trip, okay? And we, we interviewed a lot of people. This was one Darlene Nicholson had worked 34 years managing a tool crib at uh, Phillips Advanced Transformer in Boscobel, Wisconsin. When I graduated, I was 56. Yeah, this is, this is the type of person I'm worried about, okay? And yet she went through a successful re-education program, a retraining program. Uh, and, you know, if, if you look at this story, it's really a remarkable story. And it's like, this is not the popular narrative. Uh, here's a guy who was in the coal mining industry. You know, when I was in the coal, in the coal business, you know, they had, you know, we thought it was just going to be up forever. And then it started going down. And I mean, I watched for, Probably the last couple of years I was there, I was there like 13, 15 years. The last couple of years I was there, people be getting laid off every Friday. You can see people you work with for years, friends, neighbors, mm -hmm. losing their job. And you, then you you know you get the mentality, you go into work every day, say, well, when's it going to be my turn? When's it going to be my turn? And when it finally hit, it was February 2016, I told my wife, you know, I done what everybody else do, I signed up for unemployment which would only last six months. And I said, well, you know what am I going to do? So I used to, you know, my wife's kids would go to bed at night and I'd be sitting down on the porch at midnight, worried to death, what are we going to do? And, you know, I still, man, I've got, you know, I've got some friends and co-workers from Mineral Labs that's working at a gas station. You know, uh, some of them still can't find work. And, you know, I just got lucky, got real lucky to be able to go on. Can I really do this? Can I learn it? You know, can I go into this environment after being around coal for all them years? And it just, you know, because it's just totally different field. And, you know, you know, it, it, it was scary. I think when, the, you know, as I was going through the training, had a lot of people work with me and a lot of uh, their training partners, American Metalworks training partners, and, you know, I did have moments like that where I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this. And it was like, just one day it started, not long before I come here, it just started like clicking or something. And, uh, you know, and it was, and it was just great. I could have, I guess, give up and just say, well, I'm just going to work at a gas station. I'm not trying to, you know, discourage gas station workers, but work at a gas station. But, I mean, there is programs out there and there is help out there if you seek it. And just try, you know. When I first, like I said, when I first heard advanced manufacturing, I said, well, I'll be able to do that. But you know, I just kept talking to them, and they kept, you know, guiding me, and I'm like, well, yeah, I can do this. So here's a guy who was in coal mining, and now he's programming numerical control tools, making aerospace parts. Okay, that that should, you know, really make your head turn. Uh, and so what we did is we said, we want to go look at what our kind of the elements of successful programs. Could, could we characterize these successful programs? You know, what, what are the things that are really important? And there's a whole number of things. I'm going to quickly go through them. One is shorter work-based programs, okay? And if you talk to the guys at American Metal Works, uh, these were two guys who were in uh, uh, oil and gas, okay, with a, a price collapse of oil and gas. Uh, they went from, it's interesting to hear them talk about, you know, we went from 150 employers, employees down to two, 
right, these two guys, okay, and they decided what they're going to do is they're going to open up, uh, they actually came to Michigan and talked to people here about how are we going to open up an aerospace uh, uh, component supply shop, okay, and a lot of these guys have, don't want to look at four-year degree college. They have no desire to. You couldn't, really probably couldn't force them into it. But they are willing to take a, you know, 16 week course, intensive course, whether it be in plumbing, whether it be welding, whether, or, or programming. And they're willing to do that. But they're just not the type that's gonna be sitting in a classroom. And so the, I think we have to go after those kind of people. And the community college here, you know, basically because we all got together, they see the effort now of uh, doing this kind of work is going to bring these guys into something that's, it's a career. It's right, so uh, first thing is you see local leadership is like, let's, let's uh, have short programs to uh, focus on retraining. Stackable credentials was the next thing, okay, especially when you have, uh, uh, you know, people who have been in the workforce for some amount of time, it's like, they have families to support, they have life to live, right? So you have to balance the demands between uh, uh, training programs and uh, supporting their families and family responsibilities. We had one person that we talked to, uh, Marshall White at Midlands Technical College in South Carolina, he says, you know, education should be more like a freeway, right? You get on for a while, then you get back off and you uh, keep drawing that. Uh, and what you are able to do is build up things step by step. This was an example of stackable credentials. Each step I get credit for, okay? Uh, the, next the next thought was this notion of wraparound support. Now, what was incredible, this was uh, Southwest Technical College in, uh, in Wisconsin, in the little corner of uh, Wisconsin. You know, we're talking to the president of this college, uh, and we're saying, well, what kinds of things do you provide? Well, it's like, you know, sometimes our students are hungry, right? And if, if they're hungry, we don't think you can learn. So they have a, a food pantry, right? And they have a clothes closet because their students don't have the clothes to interview, right? So it's like you go check out what you need for an interview. And then sometimes they said, sometimes our students don't have money for gas to get home. So uh, uh, we have an emergency fund. And I'm asking him, it's like, do you ask people to pay it back? Because, oh, nobody ever takes more than once from the fund. And I said, well, who supports this fund? It's like our donors, okay? Uh, and what do they think about non-repayment? It's like, oh, they're okay with it. Who are your donors? They're all the employees of the college, right? So I'm sitting there with my two students, right, who are not the thin wallet type, and they're looking at this, and I said, okay, this guy, he's probably making $75,000 a year, and he's supporting all the students, right, and everybody else from the college. So it's, it's really, some of these guys are quite remarkable. Okay, matching supply with demand. Another thing that, for example, Southwest Tech did is they said, we know, for example, they, he used an example of an electrical power distribution program where, you know, we know local industry needs so many people per year, 20 to 24. We know if we train 100, we'll get the tuition, but that's actually not the right thing to do because then those people will go on the job market and they won't have jobs. Okay, so they kind of ma match supply and demand. Okay, convince candidates of their potential. Right? Now, we saw this when we went on our road trip through Appalachia. Right? Here's a guy who also was, uh, owned a trucking company and decides, I'm gonna train coal miners how to program. You know, we got a lot of applications, and um, and we offered 11 positions, uh, 10 for coal mining people and one for a non-coal mining person because everyone here didn't work in the mining industry. It's just where our hearts led us to be. And and so of those 10 that we offered, uh, they were all on unemployment with the exception of this one guy, and he had a job making $8.50 an hour, and he had been making about $80,000 a year. And he lost his home, he lost his vehicle, he lost everything, and he passed all of our tests, he was everything. And, and on the Monday when everyone showed up here for day one, he didn't show up. And I called him, I said, where are you? He said, man, I'm just a dumb old coal miner. I can't, I can't do this. And so he talked himself out of something he could be, he could have been just one of these folks and been a software developer today and been a lot better off. 
And he went, and we started him out on day one at $15 an hour. So he turned down a job that paid more because he did not, could not convince himself he could, although he had every test that we'd given everyone else. 100% of the people we selected have succeeded. So when we're talking about what are we going to do in disruption, we're going to talk about we have to teach them how to think and be problem solvers. We have to improve their digital literacy. But if you can't, if they don't believe they can do it, they're not going to do it. So it's interesting, right? It, you know, what you see in all these programs is local leadership. Uh, we've gone to places, uh, and I see some of that here. I, I, I went to one town in Mississippi where the factory had closed down, and there were people on opposite extremes of the political spectrum who couldn't agree on anything, yet they could come together and they could put, to grow, pro, put together programs like this to really re-educate people in their community, train them for new jobs, and then use that as kind of a recruiting tool to go out and recruit new firms to the area. Right, so a lot of those components are really successful programs. Uh, the reason I've been focusing on this lately is I think this is going to become more and more important. Okay? As a nation, we're going to need more flexible a more flexible workforce. I, uh, I wrote a piece for HBR that came out last week on you know, looking at the Hamtramck and uh, Lordstown closures, okay? A and you know, if you think about those problems, uh, companies, firms build resources, they build production processes, they build all these facilities to meet a customer need, a market need, at a point in time, okay? And now, the question is when the market changes, what are you going to do with the resources? What are you going to do with the people? How are you going to change that? And I think effective retraining programs are really going to be kind of a crucial part of, uh, you know, filling this kind of need. Okay. So I think uh, GM took a lot of heat last week. Okay. I, I think that's going to be a continuing problem. I think the right way to look at this problem is change is accelerating, okay, and changing out resources and processes is really hard. One of the questions I've asked people is like, okay, would you rather they change it out now or would you rather we get to another bankruptcy filing? Okay, because that's, that's also how a lot of people, uh, that's how a lot of people change things out over time. The, the major airlines have been a notable example of that. Uh, which is I'm going to shed all my legacy processes through bankruptcy, right? For me, I think this is really an impetus to think more broadly about strategy. Uh, I always tell my students and I tell a lot of uh, business leaders, it's like most problems don't get better over time, okay? So uh, if we can step up and think more strategically about this bigger picture problem, how do we think about changing out our assets? How do we think about redeploying the re our resources. I, I got a preview of the, uh, the Dr Detroit Regional Chamber report and I found it actually very gratifying in terms of the diversification of the economy. You know, much broader uh, set of firms and activities than most people in this country would realize, right? So I, I look at this as impetus to how do I, how do I as a region think about this how do I think about bringing that workforce along? How do I get ahead of some of these future problems? So those are some thoughts. And uh, 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 I, I had just a couple of additional perspectives on this. My name is Mickey Payne. I'm a this production assistant manager in the Lexus uh, assembly department. I've uh, been employed here at TMMK for 23 and a half years. You know, Toyota is a, is a you know, we make cars, but we're in the business of developing people. That's that's what enough said. Okay, in just ter in terms of now, they're also in an area where people don't like to move out of the region, right? So they think much more strategically about how I'm going to bring my whole workforce along. I think you have the opportunity here as well. One other uh, thing that I'll just mention is uh, I've gotten to know a number of foreign countries relatively well. One interesting one was. Uh, 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 I got to know people in the Danish trade union, Dance Metal, and, as well as the Confederation of Danish Industry, which is kind of an industry organization, who really work together on 
the planning for where the, their workforce goes, right? And so just a couple of thoughts on where I see some of the opportunities. So I think we're going to invite Devin up and we're gonna have questions. Is that right? <laughs> Joining Professor Shi on stage is the anchor at WDIV TV4 NBC, Devin Skillian. Hi, Devin. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks, gang. <clears throat> um, I, I, there's so many things that I, that I want to talk about. Uh, first off, I, I think it's a leap of faith that we're trying to find a way to deliver good news at a Ford Field, which <laughs> doesn't happen all the time. I saw uh, that headline yeah, this morning, up, too. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, I want to, this is it's fascinating talking about the, the retraining and, and, and sort of the, the evolution of the modern workforce, but you and I talked last week on the phone about, uh, I think, a really um, compelling question about all this, and that is whose responsibility is it? Right. Where does the responsibility lie to create a, uh, to this change in our workforce? In the not too distant past, employers worked really hard at continually putting their employees through training, continuing education. Mm -hmm. But I, in that era, we also saw workers who were planning on staying with that employer for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really not a part of the millennial plan, it seems. That's, that, that's um, right. So in the broader sense, whose responsibility is it to make all this happen? I, I think that is such an important question, and in some sense, what I see happening is this kind of falling through the cracks, right? I mean, what we were talking about last week is uh, uh, when I joined the workforce, which was 1979, I spent 28 years in industry before I went to Harvard. Uh, it was a lifelong career. My employer invested a lot in me. I, I think one of the challenges has been we've gone to a more transactional type of workforce, yeah. okay, where people will jump around as you say. Okay, I spent 14 years at IBM. Okay, I, IBM trained me, and I'm, I'm to this day still grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, they would invest in training, and I, I, I just cite the disk drive industry as an example. Every major disk drive company was founded by somebody who left IBM in San Jose. Okay, so IBM had the problem of who well, you know, if I'm going to invest in all these people, and then they're all going to be my competitors, how does that work, right? And, and I think that's what has driven us to this kind of shorter term. Now, I will answer your question uh, in a different way, and I, I, I will say I think it's everybody's responsibility, okay? I think it's the responsibility of individuals. I tell my students when they leave school, your responsibility is you must keep your skills current. Okay, because, uh, you know, there for the grace of God go I. I've seen this happen to too many in my cohort, okay? I would argue that it is in a firm's interest to invest in training and reskilling in the workforce, okay? We see examples of this in many parts of the world, like Germany, for example, yeah. right? Where the tenure is much, much longer, <laughs> yeah. firms are w willing to invest. And it's, it's one of these problems where there's kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? When I as an employee see my employer investing in me, I'm more vested in them as well, okay? So I, I think that's part of it. And, and the last part of it is I think it is a public good as well, okay? Because when a community invests like that, you know, the number one thing employers want these days when they're looking for new locations is, I need an educated workforce. I need a skilled workforce. That is the most important asset I can have, Yeah. right? So it's all of our responsibility. The real question is who's going to take leadership on that? Well, and uh, to your slide, which I was trying reading it backwards, but I believe <laughs> from back there, uh, I believe you had only Mexico spending less yes. on worker training. And I don't think I'm speaking out of school with uh, the comment that Sandy made back there. He said, and what we spend, we don't spend wisely. Yeah. How do we reinvent, and I'm, I'm not asking you to start making a, an appeal for more federal spending or public spending on that sort of thing, but how do we ratchet up our thinking in a different way? Well, 
what I found with this tour across the country with these students was actually there is a lot of funding, all right, but it, it's kind of, kind of like Christmas morning, you know, some assembly required batteries not included. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of pieces, and what I've seen uh, be successful is when local leadership who understands the needs and the character of the community pulls in a lot of these federal pieces, working with local schools, community colleges, universities, and firms, uh, and kind of focusing these resources on the needs of that community. Yeah. Right? So I think we do spend a lot, uh, but, uh, and I think there is bipartisan support for this is an important problem. Okay, it's just we descend into a lot of debates like is that actually welfare or something else? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. As, as you look over sort of the report card here, and there are, there are a lot of reasons to, to be optimistic about uh, where de the Detroit region is right now, but when you look at things like uh, worker training, uh, mm -hmm. readiness for the workforce, mm -hmm. um, number of people who have uh, higher ed degrees, on and on and on. What's the hardest one to change? What takes the longest and the most uh, intention? Uh, I, I think, uh, and I, I would characterize this as a general problem, the hardest thing to change is people's ways of working, right? We're used to doing things in a particular way, Yeah. okay, and hey, it made us successful for the last hundred years and now you want me to change, yeah. okay? And one of, the, one of the quandaries that I have often looked at is like, okay, we all know that the world is changing, right? Why can't firms change continuously with them, right? And if you look at how a firm is organized or actually any organization is organized, you have these processes, right? And the processes usually come out of repeated problem solving. It's like, oh, that worked, we'll make that a process, okay? And you institutionalize these things that make you successful, okay? But then the world changes, okay? For example, I, I would argue that that's General Motors' pro problem. I remember, I was a kid when the Lordstown plant was built, yeah. okay? Uh, I remember when they opened that, even though I was in Chicago at the time, but I remember that. I remember aluminum alloy engines. Okay, but anyways, uh, you know, you build all these things because they're right for market needs. But the problem is we have a lot of institutional mechanisms to tend to freeze them, okay? So what happens is you see firms have these kind of frozen ways of working. And by the way, people do this too. I comment, about, well, I shouldn't, this is being recorded, so I won't, <laughs> give, I won't give you the example of the Harvard Just Business School, but, bottle, but you know, but uh, we have it at the Harvard Business School as well. We have ways of working that are really hard to change, okay? Now, uh, so what, what generally happens, and I've lived through this so many times, what generally happens is you get to a crisis, and then the crisis causes everybody to say, okay, we gotta change, Yeah. okay? And then after that you change things, and then everything goes along for another dozen years or so, and then you come to another crisis. I wish it weren't so. It's kind of human nature. We're watching it right now with the way that GM is having to re retool for a, a sedanless future, well, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned. Th now, they, they have the additional problem that I have the tooling for the line, okay? Yeah, right, right. Uh, although, you know, that, that you can swap out, right? But really what it is is ways of working, okay? And I, I use the example of bankruptcy as a way of changing those things out. Well, I remember 2008, right? Bankruptcy is like we're gonna shed brands, we're gonna shed dealer networks, we're gonna shed a huge number of workers, we're gonna shed all kinds of parts operations. It was one way of updating all those processes. It's like, do we have to wait till that yeah. to do this? Yeah. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the intersection of policy and where we all are. Um, that's when quite an intersection. It, well, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's very busy and congested at the moment and confusing. Lots of different signs pointing in lots of different directions. Yeah. Um, especially uh, acutely felt, I think, in states like Michigan, yeah. where the uncertainty over tariffs and trade policy um, is 
making it almost impossible for anybody to plan on a long-term basis, uh, whether it's a 90-day delay, mm -hmm. as, as we see right now, or whether we say we have a new NAFTA, but it doesn't include it doing anything about the tariffs on steel right, and aluminum, right, right. which is the bread and butter of the industry that drives our region. What do we do? So let me first uh, make two comments before I get to what we do. Okay. okay? Uh, it's very appropriate that we're right at Ford Field, right? Because I often tell people that in business is done on the playing field. Right, you go out on the playing field, there's a set of rules, right? And all the players know the set of rules. That's what business is like. When I know the set of rules, then I can plan my investments, okay? I can, you know, deploy my assets, uh, my resources, I can plan my investments and so on. Would you go out on that r field if you don't know what the rules are today? Or if they're gonna change. Or if they're gonna the change, game. right? So that's the first problem. So when we ask, why is business withholding investment, it's like, I don't know what the rules are going to be tomorrow. Okay, now, to that point, most of my talks, like I gave a talk uh, this past Saturday on, you know, trade policy and the trade war with China and stuff like that, because that's mostly what I work on. And I told them, it's like, you know, normally, I, I never give the same talk twice, but it's ridiculous now, right, because... <laughs> I, I was changing that talk on Friday, and I go up Saturday, and it's like, okay, by this evening, I don't know what's going to go on in Buenos Aires. It's going to be different, right? You know, so that, that's the first thing is about that kind of stability, and I don't think people necessarily understand that business needs stability. If I'm going to invest billions of dollars in a factory, I need stability, right? So that, that's one thing. The, the second thing that I find really troubling, uh, and maybe we can all work on this problem, I find that a lot of uh, people, especially I talk to Washington, don't really know how the world works, don't really know how supply chains work, don't know, you know what a third tier or a fourth tier supplier would be, and don't know that I might need that specialty steel that's coming from one supplier because I can't get it somewhere else, it's going to come into this country. Uh, I have a friend who runs a uh, precision metal works company in Ohio. you know. He gets a special high-strength, high-temperature alloy steel from Vost Alpine in Austria. He makes that part. He ships it to France, where it gets put into, uh, a, you know, at Messier Doughty, and they put it into the landing gear of a Boeing 787. And then it comes back over to either North Charleston or Everett, Washington, and it gets put in the plane. Most people have no idea about the complexity of those supply chains, right? Most people have no idea that. Alaskan line caught salmon gets exported to China where it's cheaper to clean it and then it'll get frozen and it'll show up in Costco, right? Uh, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's cheaper and, to send it and, all the and, way to be cleaned in China and yeah. then ship it well, back. Than to and just and we, are, we are living in a world where we've had relatively relative stability in terms of, terms of trade, in terms of currency, in terms of uh, uh, the vast expansion of the tradable sector because of, you know, container shipping and sh air shipping and so on, right? So we live in a world that, especially the post-NAFTA regime, you know, there have been a set of rules and people have organized their supply chains around that. And now when you, and I tell people in Washington this, it's like, if you change some of those things, you know, you really need to understand what the implications are because you will get un unexpected consequences. And we're starting to see that now, big time. So my only answer is we have to do a better job of educating our leadership. <laughs> Don't laugh, please. <laughs> we're manage, we have to manage up? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I take it as my personal mission to try to educate everybody I can yeah. on these things because you have to understand it. I, I took. I took 42 students on a supply chain tour through China and Taiwan a year ago, January. It was an eye-opener. Okay, my hope is some of these people will go into policy work and then at least they'll have a better view. When we, when we were done with that trip, it was like two weeks, every day, three factories, boom, 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 boom. We're gonna see all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I said, at the end of two weeks, it's like you now have a better view of how supply chains work than most of the people in Washington. Yeah, gotta be. Um, the last thing I wanted to make sure that we spent a little bit of time on, I'm, and I suppose maybe it's a selfish issue as a father of four millennials, but I, I wonder how well we measure underemployment. 
and how big of a problem th that is at the moment. Um, while we're busy trying to retool lots of different levels, um, we've watched a lot of employment slide backwards and a lot of it has landed on our millennials and I suppose uh, somebody working at Starbucks is fully employed and has benefits but that yeah. wasn't originally what they maybe got their degree in philosophy to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but what, how do you feel that we're doing when it comes to underemployment and just as importantly at understanding how big that problem is? I think we've only scratched the surface on that right now. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, to me it is really uh, realizing the full potential in people, okay? and. Uh, you know, it's easy to say for me, who had a great college education and postgraduate education, okay, but uh, many students from this, from this area, who I talk to a lot, and I have, I have a lot of students who come from this area, talked about how there was a time when there was, you know, kind of preparation to enter trades as an alternate path mm -hmm. uh, a, in high school. And, uh, you know, going out of high school, not everybody should necessarily go to college. And this region used to do that very well and it served this region very well for a long time. Uh, I, I worry about that. I, you know, whenever I use one of these ride-sharing platforms like Lyft or Uber, I always interview the driver. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a very interesting thing yes. to do that. You, you learn a lot from that. I, and so I, I worry about that. I don't have a great answer on that. Okay, but uh, y you know it, it's, it's kind of are you living up to your full potential? Okay, and uh, I guess my personal answer is I try to teach, right? And I try to teach my students. I try to teach other people uh, about how to think about this problem. What what can we personally do about this problem? Yeah. Um, I, I guess we'll finish it by talking about uh, just in general the. the the national image uh, of Detroit and what you take away from these. We mentioned this a little bit on uh, Flashpoint this past Sunday. We have worked so hard to diversify this region, but I'm not sure that anybody signed up for us to not be the automobile or mobility capital of the world. Um, and when we get news like what we got from GM uh, two weeks ago and, and uh, to a degree from Ford, though I think we still have more to learn mm -hmm. from them, um, I think a lot of people started to think, wait a minute, what is our, what is our position here? Where, where, where are we? We've got all this R&D, all of this institutional knowledge here, but are we really positioned for a very strange new world? So I would argue that that is an opportunity for this region. When I got a preview of the report, uh, the chamber sent me a, a, a preview version of the mm -hmm report, I looked at it and it's like, I had no idea that you were as diversified here as you are, right? Which is to a credit, a credit to everybody in the region. Now, having said that, you are still tagged with this Motor City label, right? That is the perception around Detroit. Uh, let's see, I, I would send my students to go take marketing. Okay, it's like, that's a marketing problem. Although, you know, <laughs> I, would, I, I, would also, I would also observe that maybe you need to think about that more broadly, right? Because when I, uh, wander around German industry, okay, manufacturing powerhouse, obviously. Yep. The German auto industry, uh, the Germ German manufacturing is dominated by automotive, mm -hmm. okay, but their reputation is actually much broader than that, right? So as I, as I look at this region, it's like, well, what goes with automotive? What kind of capabilities do you have? Industrial engineering, first of all. Okay, mechanical engineering, obviously, all those other disciplines, right? But, you know, volume manufacturing, complex manufacturing, is that fungible to other areas? Absolutely, sure. right? Military so manufacturing. Military, for sure. Defense, defense manufacturing, that was I, what I was telling my friend in Ohio, who's been pushing the governor and everybody there. I said, you know, you're already very big in aerospace. People just don't know it, right? Yeah, uh, right. Ohio's big in aerospace. Michigan, you have a lot of defense manufacturing. You have a lot of those other capabilities, right? And, you know, uh, one of the things we talked about on the phone last week is you have people who are relatively stable in terms of staying in the region, right? So those are all assets that I think you can pull together. And then 
then it's how do I tell that story? Yeah. Right? Because, you know, you do a good job on it. You can make it a very attractive, you know, you have affordable housing, right? Been in California lately? Try staying at a uh, Marriott Fairfield Inn for $550 a night, you know? Uh, sorry, nothing, no offense to Marriott, okay? But it's like, this is nuts, you know? So, uh, you know, could you make this an attractive area for employers? I think so. You have a huge supplier network, you have a lot of those skills, you have a lot of those capabilities, so I would go for it. Yeah. Uh, friends, let's thank Professor Chi for some great thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.